Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the YouTube Model Builders Fine Scale Live Build for Tuesday, May 9th. Uh, we're back this time for the second in this series uh, about an industrial structure. Uh, we've got several of our people with us, hopefully Mike Dent, George Jordan, Jordan, Sue, but uh, Barry and uh, Miles Hill, of course, uh, Ralph Redzetti, and of course, hosted by our illustrious Johnny. So thank you very much for joining us. And back to you for a moment, Johnny. All righty, Andy. Uh, I want to tell everybody to go to YouTubeMallBuilders.com. There you can check on the uh, schedules for the Tuesday, Wednesday shows and the uh, live show. Thursdays are uh, every Thursday night. And be sure and click on the eMag so you can sign up for an email notification when the eMagazine comes out. Got another issue coming out uh, next month. And if you did not see it, check our YouTube channel because JD made up a really nice video, that uh, short video about the e-magazine. So you may want to check that one out. Don't forget the e-magazine is free. So just like these shows, they're all free too. Everything's free here. We have no ads. Uh, the may just pawning off the YouTube channel to you. <laughs> anyway, uh, don't forget Tuesday and Wednesday night shows start at 8 o'clock Central Time, 9 o'clock Eastern. And the Thursday and Saturday show starts at 9 o'clock Central and 10 o'clock Eastern Time. So, be sure and uh, check your schedules. Uh, we did have a little change for May and June. Not much, but it's on the Tuesday night shows. So you want to be sure to check those. If you're having to work or just happen to miss the show, don't worry about it. We record everything. So it's on the YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube Mall Builders on YouTube, and there we have the playlist. So you can look in there to find your uh, shows that you missed so you can get caught back up on them. And we'll turn it back over to Mr. Andy and get this show on the road. All right, this time, so so last time we were slightly short-handed with, with a few people. We were uh, uh, short of Barry at a, at a mile, so we wouldn't get caught up on what they're doing. But the, we started this industrial structure series that we're going to do for for a series of shows. Um, covered some structural stuff last time. I did a little bit of paint on, on materials as I'm working with mine flat. But I want to get caught up, especially with what some of these fellows are doing uh with what Miles and Barry are doing, and, it's, and Miles is doing something just incredibly fascinating. And I, I've uh, I've snuck a little bit, got caught up a little ahead, of, a little ahead of time on what he's doing. What are you doing, Miles? What kind of craziness are you up to? Uh, I'm seeing how many days I can stay up and not sleep. <laughs> um, Andy's referring to. I, I I showed a building on YouTube Model Builders when I did a tour of my railroad. This has been many months ago. But I showed the campus, can you hear me? Okay, I showed the building uh, several months ago and um, it's the Kansas City Stockyards building and it's like seven feet long and three feet high and a couple feet deep, takes up a big footprint on the railroad. But I wanna talk about several things. First of all, I think it's really neat to be a model maker and you suddenly get the chance to do a little research because the only way to really make things look right is if you understand the industries that you're modeling. Um, so one thing I had to do was I had to go and do a little research on this Kansas City Stockyards building. Well, first of all, the Stockyards building was an office building. It was where the people could did the beef and the pork and the uh, sheep had their offices. And crews of auctioneers that were assigned to various floors and areas of the stockyards would come out of this building assigned from various buyers and wholesalers and whatever else. So the first thing they had was, it, Kansas City was second only to Chicago. They had a fantastic uh, stockyards complex, covered many, many acres, a lot of city blocks. And that's a picture of some of the uh, buyers from Armour and Swift and whatever standing outside of a stock stand to buy. Now, the thing about this that's, that's interesting for my project is cattle can be housed in these pens out in these vast areas of the open um, city 
city area where the stockyard was. However, pigs, hogs, on the other hand, have no way to sweat. So they had to have a multi-floored sheltered area that they were brought into and they were housed in all of these pens. Here's the railroad car coming in, the stock car coming in to drop them off their chutes. And they were put here under cover to keep them cooler. So that's how the hogs went. So what I decided to do a long time ago, before I showed you the building, before I built that carcass building, was to combine the hogs and the cattle into this stockyards building. It was the only way that I could kind of get every, the, the flavor of everything all together. So while the hog building was off in one part of the stockyards and the stockyards themselves were off someplace else and this big office building was off away from that, I'm sure they didn't want to smell the, the smell of so although it would have been impossible to get away from. But anyway, so the first thing I had to do was over the past several weeks, I have been working on constructing the hog pens. Now the hog pen here is about five feet long. It's, um, it's built to be mostly concrete. And I did a lot of processes to make this. For one, I started off with my laser cutter and I drew this out on a CAD program because I had to make sure that every one of these columns was going to line up from one pen to the other. Probably the hardest thing about this is keeping everything parallel and straight. So what I did was I cut out two sections two pins at a time out of a piece of eighth inch Luon plywood and then glued that um, in place with my bracing, which I'm gonna spin around here and show you. Whoops, I custom cut all of the braces here, all of the uh, beams and put them in place. Once I had them in place and I had everything lined up, then I took a mortise machine. Those of you who aren't familiar with a mortise machine, it's a square chisel that's made to cut square holes in furniture and I literally cut square holes that go all the way through. This is the bottom of the piece. And you can kind of see the square hole here coming through. Had to be lined up on four different levels. But the laser cutting, because I had already cut the square out, all I had to do was put my chisel on that opening and poke it through and it lined up every time when I went then to glue them together. So that got me my hog pin. I'm not, I have not done the stock pin side for the cattle. Uh, as a minute, you're gonna see. It's a big enough project just to get this pig pen area started. So anyway, behind the pig pens, there's a little bit of an inlet and I wanted to create the office building. Now the office building is a little bit different and I hope I'm not getting in trouble with copyrights here, but if we do, somebody will say something. This is a picture that I picked up off the internet and it shows the front of the stockyards building, which fortunately for us in Kansas City is still in business. It's a loft uh, housing down in the, the old area where the stockyards resided. They're not there obviously anymore, but the lofts, and these are kind of high-end lofts, um, are down there. A lot of artists have places in some of the bottom area. So anyway, you can see the window configuration of the stockyards building. I have put this off for many, many months. Those of you who remember seeing this on the, on the show know that I haven't done anything with it in a long, long time. And I kept thinking, all right, how am I going to make a brick building? Because a brick building, as you can tell here and almost every other building, has a return. In other words, the bricks on the face and then the windows are back set inside. That brick has to come across and then return back in. And how was I going to get that three dimension? Because I wanted to do it with a photographic print. I wanted to be able to print the paper and put it on. I found a printer out in California that would print a sheet that was 85 inches long and 32 inches high. The cost was, needless to say, quite high. And I was still going to have to apply that then onto eighth inch plywood or something else to get that relief. So I called a friend of mine here in town, uh, Paul Coates, who owns one of the biggest advertising agencies in town. He knows everybody. And he said, well, you need to go see my friend Tom over at Harvest Graphics. And I had already done the artwork and I'll have to go a little bit away so my volume will go down here, but I want you to see one of the prints that Tom made for me. That is 62 inches by 32 inches. It's brick and there's not a blemish on the entire thing. It is printed on Sintra. Those of you who are not familiar with Sintra, Sintra is PVC 
in sheet form. This is three mil, three uh, millimeters thick, which is approximately an eighth of an inch. So that gave me my eighth of an inch depth. Then I said, okay, it's printed on plastic and it's printing. So how good is this stuff gonna last? I mean, I went ahead with good faith and did it. And then I ran a bunch of tests after that. I don't know if you can see the, the brick on here. I understand from, I, I talked to Barry earlier this afternoon. He said it was doing a lot of um, not showing up very well. So I hope, hope it shows up somewhat. Anyway, these are the window cutouts that I made. I'm gonna give these away as samples to various people, but nonetheless, <coughs> excuse me. I did some tests on them and this one has um, Krylon matte finish, no damage. This one has dull coat, no damage. I took a rag with water on it, um, shop rag, and scrubbed the front. It will not scrub off. About the only thing that affects this is if you actually scrape it with a metal blade or something else, or if you drop something on it, the Sentra is somewhat soft, obviously because I can cut it with an Exacto, but it is somewhat soft. So in order to make this one wall that's going between the, behind the hog pens, I had to cut, let's set this up here so you get an idea. <coughs> here's the hog pen. And here's the wall that I've been working on that uh, Andy was talking about. That's my wall that's going up behind with all of the windows cut in it. And uh, needs to say it's a lot of work to cut, but it's not that hard to cut. And because it is somewhat, um, I don't know what to, it's durable, I guess I should say. Um, I'm going to take you guys off the stand here and bring up a whole lot closer, hopefully without losing it. But here's one window. You can see I've made us a mock-up. Um, that's taking the cricket and cutting out a window insert, which is the red around the sides. Then I took some um, 100 by 100, uh, one will be one tenth of an inch or one tenth of an inch angle from Evergreen and made the sill. The cricket made the, the actual, what would be the styles and rails of the window frame. So I have a long ways to go, but just to get this point has taken about three or four days to cut out all these windows. And then of course I have, I don't know, eight sides or something in this building because it's in and out and all around. So I have a whole lot more windows yet to cut out, but I am just so, immensely impressed with the print quality. It was done on a five by nine plotter printer at Harvest Graphics here in Kansas City. I don't know if anybody could find something someplace else, but I'll try and put a link up to Tom and to Harvest if anybody else wants to try this. To me, if you're doing a print where you can make a photographic example of your building, that was have a photographic piece that is sized correctly. If you print it on this center, I think it would be absolutely phenomenal building especially if you're doing, this one's actually a foreground building, but especially if you're doing a background building, what a heck of a concept to be able to put the building up in one shot. <laughs> especially, sorry, I've been sick the last two days. The, the idea that I could create a background building, and if those of you who have seen photographic buildings know they are absolutely totally real because you have real light, you have a real brick, you have real stone, you have real windows, I mean, the building just looks so dynamic and so real. And the thing that the center adds is it adds a texture. And I don't think you're going to catch this at all. But there is just a little bit, I mean, a micro pebble finish on this center. <coughs> Excuse me. If you're trying to simulate bricks, stone, or concrete, this stuff is phenomenal for the texture before the print is ever applied to it. This is the same material that we used at Woodland Scenics to make the uh, culverts. The culverts, if you, if you remember them, they have scribe lines off in the concrete casting work, but that texture on there is the Sentra. Huh. Uh, slightly distressed, but for the most part, it is the surface of the culverts that you get from Woodland Scenics. And I think everybody thinks those are pretty realistic looking. Yeah. Um, I think the Sentra is fantastic. What's that? This is, go this is going on my O and 30 layout. So it's essentially O scale. 
Although that that structure is about waist high and about you know twice as wide as a door, so I, I don't. There wasn't a whole lot of us that were assuming it was in scale or anything. That's a that's a no. heck of a structure at any scale. Um, that's right. This is uh, eight eight or nine stories, I think, and so it's a it's a big building even in no scale. Is that material? Uh, is that material uh, solvent? Uh, can you attack it with solvent? So can you use a regular the solvent only, adhesive? The only solvent that I know that will work on it is the. It's what's intended for PVC. You've got to go to a piece, PVC glue. I, I, I have tried. I've tried my 10x7. I've tried all kinds of things, and it's impervious to it. It doesn't care. Um, it just won't won't seal it. You've got to yeah. go to an actual PVC glue because this is essentially foamed foamed PVC that's extruded. So if you look at the edge of it, and again, the, the cameras aren't near the quality to do this, but there is a, a skin coat on the front and the back. And if you look at the texture in the center, it has a porosity to it, very fine porosity, almost that of your own skin. But um, there is a porosity because it's been foamed um, and then extruded. Um, but it is pure PVC. Well, that is about as cheap of an adhesive as you could ask for. I mean, to get, you know, just using pipe adhesive, pipe glue on it. Yes, yeah, exactly. And uh, I like it because you can spill th other things on it, whatever, and it doesn't touch it. It is stainable, I can tell you that, because all of the sides of these windows that you see here, all that red that you see on the edge, that looks like the brick return, that's all done with a Pantone um, this one's redwood, but I used actually burnt sienna. But it's just a Pantone marker that I came in there and stained. As a matter of fact, uh, I can get the top off of these. I've been having a heck of a time getting the tops off of these. I think I'm only been sick and getting weak. But knock the top off if I can. <laughs> Man, they're really tough. All right, so, so here's here's the white Centra edge, the marker. And you can see right there, I mean, it's just instantaneous. It's uh, for its stainability. Uh, it's also paintable, um, but to me, that's turn it so you can see it better. It's just immediate, and it takes the stain very, very well. Um, so you can get it. You can get it to go to almost any color that you would want to go to. I, I was staining some of the bottoms of these windows with the gray to give it a concrete look, and it they look great. But anyway, that's what I've been working on. Is one big building. Miles, I'm surprised at the actual size of it. Whatever happened to selective compression? <laughs> Actually, this building is selectively compressed. It Holy off mac! With... <laughs> it started the off story he was telling, he basically merged two buildings together. He didn't have enough room to model possibly both of those structures some different distance. And didn't you model, didn't you basically merge two structures together somewhat to, or put them real close together? The stockyards exchange building is much bigger than the one I'm making. I mean, it was absolutely humongous, um, covered a block plus. But um, I, I've already compressed that. And then I came in, the actual building was essentially a, a rectangle footprint. I've come in on both sides and kind of put indents on them, which is where the uh, pens will fit. Um, so I've kind of taken some liberties with it. It's, it doesn't follow the photographs. 100%. If we're doing fine scale modeling, yeah, I'm using fine scale techniques and whatever, but I'm not copying the blueprints word for word. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, by, by terminology, my, my opinion would be to say fine scale is, is or my instinct about fine scale, and, and I want to get your all's take on this as we go through the show and have more time to talk about this throughout anyway, is to kind of get more, more broad take on this. But if you're exactly replicating a photograph, I would call that high fidelity modeling. Uh, well, I, I would call it prototype modeling because you're actually coming off the prototype. Sure. On the other hand, if you're trying to do it, I, I think the um, NMRA calls it conformity. To me, if you're, you know, if, if I made this a flat photograph, then that's not necessarily conformity because in a real brick building, the windows sit back in. My windows sit back in, so I've gone to conform to the prototype. Um, there's, there's some fine distinctions here between the terminologies that we use when we describe these models. But to me, if you're trying to make it look as close as you can to the actual model, I mean, I put sills on these windows, I'm putting glass glazing in there, I'm putting 
window shades back behind the windows, you're going to an awful lot of trouble to create something that looks like, quote unquote, the real thing. Yeah, my instinct about the term fine scale has to do with the quality of the craftsmanship involved and the end result being prototype like or yes. is accurate to what could have existed or or and that allows for selective expression and for uh, creative license and artistic license but still gives you the quality of prototype or or uh, you know or high fidelity or whatever other type of terminology you would use but yes. fine scale doesn't paint you in a box it just declares that you're trying to meet a certain quality objective or that's my instinct about it that's right I just, um, I, I think this, 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 the discovery of the fact that they can print with such durability on this Centra, the fact that you have a texture in the Centra, um, to me, that's as good as finding the stencils when John first created them now 30 years ago or better. Uh, I think this is a great boon to being able to build models freeform. In other words, not necessarily doing a kit, but doing scratch building because this is going to allow you to print bricks, uh, stone, any kind of masonry work, even concrete would look great on this. Um, and it's going to be durable. It's not going to break the first time you handle it. But that was one thing I worried about the paper was if I made this paper building and then I started to put my scenery around it, what happens when I spray that scenic cement? Yes. Because then my ink starts to run and bleed. Well, yeah. you can't hurt this stuff. I mean, I've tried, like I say, almost every one of the sprays that normally would tear up the inks on paper, and they didn't phase this. And uh, the water scrubbing, scenic cement, nothing phases this. So that means I'm going to be able to plant that building and do all my scenery techniques as I normally would. To me, that's a super plus. Uh, you got a prototype look, and you got something that you can handle and work with. Wow. <laughs> how hard is that to cut, like when you cut all those windows out? I've gone through, this is, there, there are 80 sets. So I've, I've made 160, there are 84. I've made 168 cut windows. <laughs> Witness. Wait, square, you can just cut it with a regular X-Acto blade? I cut them with a regular X-Acto blade. Nice. Number 11 X-Acto blade. I've gone through, huh. I believe, four blades. To get That's not too far. bad. That's pretty good. Not too bad. Now, I do... They almost always break on the tip, and what I do is I come back in, then I, I back cut them, and I slim them a little bit on the edge. So I use them beyond just the first time the tip breaks. But it really, it takes about three strokes, and you're through it. Okay. And what I, what I did in order to do that, I'll show you here real quick. This part is kind of interesting. I wasn't sure what I was going to do to lay this out, so the first thing I had to do was I took some paper and I cut it to fit on the wall. Now, obviously, it did not have the windows cut out like it does now. But I laid that out here. And you can see most of my layout marks, I think, if I get a real close enough. You can see my layout marks here. Yeah. Telling me where to, where to cut, where not to cut, whatever. And I had to come in here and I figured, all right, I need 14 windows. And I, this is the part of the thing that I think is really neat when you go to scratch build. I took my photograph here and I said, all right, this window is slightly taller than it is wide. <coughs> and then I took my calipers and I started doing proportions. I'm a PE teacher. I hate math, but you have to use it sometimes in build builds. <laughs> so I figured out these windows were about four by six with what should be about a foot or so of this column in between the windows so that means yeah. if my windows are four that's eight that's nine these windows are approximately nine feet by six feet each on their openings total right uh, each one of these each one of the openings that cut out so only four by six but nonetheless <laughs> so the first thing i had to do was establish the size of the window then i came back and i said all right what's the total width of this entire piece of stuff that i'm working on and then come back and figure out all right so how many can I fit across here? And it looked like to me that this wide column in between, got too many, too many things going too many places, is about the same as the width of the window. A little bit less maybe. So then I figured out, well, how many columns can I do and space them out? I wind up with one center column. 
<coughs> and I had 14 windows across and six windows high. And the bottom's not cut, of course, because that's going to have the, the pig pen in front of it, the hog pen. So I had to cut that. Um, and then at the top, I did a little more calculations. I said, all right, at the top, I didn't see it or not, but they've got the wording that says Kansas City Stockyard Exchange, and they've got a cornice. So this is the top piece that I have not done anything with it. I was looking today online to see what I can find in the way of dental moldings. <laughs> but this is going to be my verbiage across here where it's as Kansas City Stockyards, it's literally written across the top of the building in huge letters. You can see it there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's going in my strip up here. And then that leaves me all of this, which leaves the area here down to almost the top of that first window course for my dental and my cornice work. So I've got to go find some dental and cornice work that I can put in there. I don't really want to cut enough dental to go all the way around this building. I think Fran and I were figuring out it's going to be about 16, 17 feet around this thing. That's a lot of work, and I don't want to do that. I'll, is that I'll, cordis, find, I'll find something commercial. Is that cordis a concrete <laughs> material or a brake material? Uh, this structure that, that I'm working on has uh, has uh, brake cordises, and the kit come with these uh, multiple pieces so you could build out whatever quarter style that you wanted to build out so you could stack yes. up the pieces they're slightly one slightly thinner than the other etc and it comes with this top piece has uh bricks in the vertical position so you know, a lot like uh the photo that i'm modeling off of and i'll show that guy when we get back to me in a little bit but it lets you build out a stack of components you could probably get uh, actually i know you can for Black Monster Model Works or, uh, or Nick over at uh, Magic That Laser Art, uh, selling the, the individually laser cut little just strips of brick so you can build out, you know, build up a couple steps of your quarters work if it's a brick material. Got a question? Yeah. Yes, sir. All right, uh, North Star Rail Lines, this is for you, Miles, so you'll have to get kind of close to the microphone. Uh, he said he missed the name of the material. Miles is using, and where can you uh, buy it? It's Centra, and if you give it a minute, I'll go over on the computer and swing around here. I'll go over and I'll look it up real quick and find out. I, I believe it's C E N T R A, but it may be S E N, but I'll find out here in a minute. Um, yeah, it's used in extensively by sign companies and graphics companies. Obviously, that's what I went to to find this stuff, but. It's used extensively by them um, for signage, especially what we used to call gas toppers. Those signs that go on top of gas pumps that advertise, you know, burgers or whatever happens to be in your local area. Um, and they like it because that PVC is impervious to weather, sun, water, rain, that effect. It so. seems like what I've seen um, political advertising political advertising going on uh, that type of material too that's a plat core but it's more it has more of a corrugated core but it is the surface of the material is a plastic material of some sort yeah. well while he's looking at that looking at that for a minute we'll get back to to miles here in a few minutes barry why don't you tell us what tell us what about this kit since we didn't get a catch up with you last month actually last week or so uh What's this kit you're working on? Especially interested in what scale it's at, uh, what scale it's in, because I know it's in a unique scale. Well, it's a S scale building. It's going to be the first, the first building I'm starting on on my uh, SN2 narrow gauge layout. Uh, it's known as the Turner Center Creamery from Wiscasset, Maine. Uh, I'm roughly going to be doing it around 1910. Uh, it's a waterfront building served by the railroad. It was Cassett Waterville and Farmington Railroad uh, by a trestle in the front side of the building with a small dock out front where people can unload uh, material for it and everything. Uh, see if you can see it right here. This is what the building will look like. That's an actual photograph of the original building. They did a real nice job cutting the material for it, but I haven't figured out how the floor is supposed to fit because it doesn't match the size of the building or the little shed on the side. So um, what I'm, pl I'm planning on doing is taking uh, some small coffee stirs and building a subfloor structure uh, 
a la joist and uh, rim joist and put a floorboard on and do each of the floors because it's three three floors tall so i have to go get my coffee stars and start planning that out once to get the walls assembled but i wanted to share something with you here some pictures of it all right yeah all right give me my picture there we go no, i want to go back to that there we go okay so this is a, a, a postcard of the wiscasset waterfront uh, th this is how the railroad would bring in the materials or takeaway materials was along a little trestle like this along the waterfront all the buildings butted up to the front of the trestle and there's a small walkway in front of them between the building and the trestle so there's no wharf or anything other than to the left of this image where you see the ship in the front foreground there's a small pier that goes out for unloading lumber and coal and offloading uh potatoes which was a big staple of this railroad in maine and there was one supposedly the turner center creamery is the place that invented the eskimo pie Nice. That we all know and love. So he, I did some research for the interior details because I wanted to probably figure the first floor. I want to do some manufacturing details. So these are butter churns. So I got to figure out scratch. Most of this stuff is going to be scratch built. So it's going to take me a while to get the interior going. But I might make the floor, you know, at least the first floor I'll fix in place. The second floor I may make leave removable for now. So I can get down to the first floor and work on it. But here's some of the machinery you might see. That is an actual bottle of milk from the Turner Center Creamery. You can get these on eBay. So I can design that in H and S scale and get them 3D printed uh, for use in the machinery. Uh, this it's is some more modern milk. What's that, Miles? It's an awfully clear milk. Yeah, <laughs> so here's a mention of uh, some uh, ice cream machinery tools and supplies so I can look at, uh, you know, kind of stuff that I might be able to make for the interior. And here's the uh, actual model. That's the prototype. I think this is the O-scale one from Deer River Laser that made the kit. This is the core bell detail at the top and the windows and the signage, at that, which is all included. And then here's a shot of the the finished building other than it's missing the uh there's a bump out you can put on the left so i'm probably going to put that there and that little sign in the right corner down there is a sign for eskimo pies for five cents so it's an interesting uh little railroad a little interesting building oops it's a good size that. structure yeah where that ship was uh, was where the the dock was at. That I think that was the Hesperon. So the that the ships would pull up to the side of the dock, and they would unload lumber or coal, um, you know, uh, potatoes too, because there's big potatoes up in Maine. It was well known for that. So, so what I started with so far, after I did all my research, let me switch to my bench cam here. Let's show you what I got here. So this is going to be the base for the for the building to sit on. So a small portion of the building set back here on the land, and then the ground was slipped away. There was uh, let's see if I have some of these here. It was like stone rip wrap sitting along the front here, and then the bulk of the building came out here on pilings, and then the railroad trestles were out in front. So. Grab the walls of the building here. I'll show you what it would look like. So this is all got to get started on. I got to get my colors chosen for the model. So this would actually sit out over the water. Let me see if I can bring this forward some. Let's see better. Yeah. So this is going to sit over the water like this on the front here, and okay. the, live just a little way here and from unloading the cars and on this side over here just 
front door to offload milk cans and everything. So I'll slip this down here. Often it's one coarse, taller phone. Figure that part out yet, but this, this is what she's got. Several buildings all along the waterfront, just like this, and related two of them in S scale. All of them, including the dwarf fusion, um, in O scale. So I'm working on it for. Okay, thanks, John. So um, it's definitely going to be in a, an interesting build for me to do. All right. So let me give you read a little history of this here. So the Turner Center Creamery, which was owned by the Turner Center Daring Association from 1898. Uh, it was at one time the largest commercial creamery in Maine and one of the three largest in New England. It was founded in 1882. By the turn of the century, the association marketed 23% of all cream and 35% of all butter commercially produced in the state and employed 32% of all the dairy factory hands in Maine. It had 41 branch offices in New England and Canada with an additional processing plant in Boston. And in 1917, it manufactured the first commercial ice cream in New England. And the association's founder, Edwin Levitt Bradford, is credited with the invention of the celebrated Eskimo pie. The many other ice cream manufacturers around the country have made the same claim. It's uh, an interesting little building. And a lot of interior possibilities. So that's why I still got more research to do to see. Yeah, I can put the butter churns. I can put uh, open tables for doing cheese making and butter making. So I got to kind of figure out what it all is going to look like in there. But I'm going to start on constructing the walls itself, pick my paint scheme, get that all together. And then hopefully when I'm back in July, uh, if I have time with the wedding and everything, you'll see more of the building itself. I'll have the, the scenery base ready to start building the pilings and the understructure to hold the building up and then we'll see how it goes i got a comment jl and sh rail fanners for life he uh, said the wwnf the only two-foot gauge railroad in the u.s no there was about a dozen two-foot railroads in maine and one in connecticut um, WWNF was one, the Bridgeton Saka River. Um, right, so it's the most popular. Was, yeah, the, 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 the Ranger Lake Sandy River one, yes. That's the most well known one, the most one. You can find a lot of commercial models. I have a couple of car kits, this building, um, the Alna Center station, and I can get the Preble's Milk Stop station. All scratch build. There's a lot of drawings available and stuff like that, for like the stations in Wiscasset and the head tide. So I have enough material to build a nice section of the railroad, which I'm tending to build this as a modular layout out in my garage. So this should fit out quite well with my plans. But I've seen several modular clubs doing um, ON2 or SN2 in some of the main prototypes and the uh, Sandy River and Ranger Lakes, I've seen quite a bit of coverage of those. So there seems to be quite a bit of brass material. But I was reading something about yes, that. Yes, the Sandy River and Ranger Lakes is the most popular one of the bunch. So, I've seen um, the material uh, recently about those, that there was four major two-footers in Maine alone, uh, you know, sometime, you know, probably in the 20s. Yeah. You know, most of the narrow gauge lines didn't, you know, didn't survive too well, uh, you know, through until the 30s or 40s building here that I'm modeling was tore down around 1920. And, well, most uh, of the narrow gauge railroads were gone by the 50s, right? I mean, Miles, when did the yeah. three foot narrow gauge, Colorado narrow gauge, was the 50s, right? Yes, or yeah, at least they were they were seriously fading by then. Yes, exactly. 
be an interesting build. Yeah, Miles, did you figure out what that material was? How that's spelled? Say all the all right, it's the actual name is Sintra, S I N T R A. I found some of it on Amazon in different sizes. If you just want the blank board and you want to do stuff with it, if you'd like to print, um, then here's the contact information for Harvest Graphics. It's Harvest Graphics, and I can't read the, the message backwards, but you all can see it. It is Lene. Oh, great. All right, then I'll read it to you. Harvest Graphics, <laughs> it's 14625 West 100th Street, Lenexa, Kansas. The phone number for, for Tom is 913-438-5556. And his name is Tom Novosky, N-O-V-A-S-K-Y. His phone number is 913-438-5556. Four three eight five 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 six. They have they they are actually in an old building that was used by Sprint. Here, no, those of you who don't know, Sprint's kind of headquarters here in Kansas City. Anyway, they have several blocks of campus. This is in one of their old buildings. <coughs> really nice. It's a huge facility. They have two Heidelberg presses that can run newspaper-sized sheets at the rate of fifteen thousand per hour. Oh. Um, plus that, wow. Plus, yeah, I mean, it's an amazing facility to go through, and he's glad to give you a tour if you make it here. But nonetheless, this 5 by 9 plotter printer does an absolutely unbelievable job, and he will print things much smaller. The advantage that he has is he has a couple of three graphic artists that will take your file and make sure that it will print, and they'll kind of massage it to make sure that it comes out um, the way that you want it. So Tom, Tom is not a model railroader, but he was really fascinated by what I was doing because he's never had anybody ask for that before. And he's more than willing to work with anybody that wants to call him um, and try and get some things printed. And they will print on Daterboard. They'll print on Centra. They actually printed the top of the folding table. They have a, a table like I've got here that's you know, a 30 inch by six foot table that you'd see like for a banquet. And they printed the top of it. I mean, they can print on almost anything. And Jeez. they work They work on that table constantly. And I swear the place that they printed is much more durable than the surface of the table itself. I mean, it's, it's just amazing how this paint holds up so, or the ink actually. So the next question is what did they print on the top of the table? Uh, they printed a, an advertisement for themselves. Oh, it was just okay. a graphic for Harvest Graphics. <laughs> but it was just the idea that they could. They can print on glass. Tom and I have been talking about doing a print on plexiglass. If we did a real thin piece of plexiglass and I had some um, ocean or some water surface, we think that we could print on that plexiglass and what actually looked like water because it would have that glassine look to it, and yet you'd have the colors of the uh, stream or the, or the pond or whatever, where they would variegate from the darker green or black out towards the, maybe the sandy color of, of the beach. So there's all kinds of possibilities of what they can and can't print and what they can do. Um, here, it's just gonna be kind of let our, let our imagination go for a while here and work with him and see what we come up with. Definitely sounds like some fascinating stuff to work with. Yeah, you Absolutely. can tell my mind, my mind's been going crazy on stuff that I could make. And if he can, if... Okay. So I started last week doing uh, a Foss scale um, hot dog stand. And I pretty well finished it. So let me just show you what it looks like. So it's a uh, clapboard siding. I used masking tape on the roof. And I wasn't too worried about whether it, it, it was three foot strips, but I got a little narrower up near the top um, just to make it even on both sides, I did the same thing. Um, that's what it looks like from the front. Not, not the greatest picture, but it gets better. 
and they they gave me they gave me a stencil to put the word eat on the side um and rather than use the the printed paper they gave me with the signs i scanned them and i printed my own and i got them to the exact size that i wanted so it's it's doug makes some nice kits yeah that that weathering with the dirt splashing up on the bottom section that looks great and that's um oh I forget the name of the company now. Oh, Vallejo. It's a Vallejo wash, a, a green sort of mossy wash. Man, it looks great. Nice touch. Now, I, I don't know whether you can see the <laughs> sign on the top. Oh, yeah, I can read it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> oh, but it gets better. Ralph, ha we have some pigeons. Off to you, Ralph. I got some pigeons as well. <laughs> that's too, it's too good. Yeah, uh, that's funny. The only the only problem I had with this kit, it had virtually no instructions. So you basically had to figure out where things went. And because it's small enough, oh, it, it wasn't done. all oh, that yeah. difficult. So now what I'm working on, I started on this. Um, let's see, turn it around for you. It's imagine that laser art. It's called Building D, Industrial Building D. And it's basically a backdrop building. And uh, Nick had... Imagine a laser art. He, he has uh, graciously given us interior loading dock details. Wow. So this builds up and fits right behind the loading dock doors. He's now, if you look at his website, just to mention, I don't think those are released yet. We got an early prototype of those, but they should be out on his site pretty soon. Yep. Yep. And I just now, happened. Do you, ever, do you ever go to the... Fine scale expo at all, Ralph? Yep. I've been there three times and I've given clinics twice. Have and you was, really? Yep. And For your I, name I, on the clinic list. I literally had to sell myself because I I normally weather uh, rolling stock and locomotives, and when I offer yeah. to do a clinic for them, they said, "No, we don't we don't do that kind of stuff. We're fine scale structures." I said, yes, I know. And you guys take a lot of time and effort and take it to the nth degree to weather your fine scale buildings. And then you run a toy train past the front of it or behind it. <laughs> yeah. So I said, yeah. the two are going to end up complementing each other. He says, well, I'll get back to you. Well, he was gone for about an hour and a half, two hours. This was Jimmy Dignan. Yeah. He came back at me and he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, we'll take it. We'll, we want you to do the clinic. So I did it two years in a row. Oh, wow. I was at the one oh, yeah, in, in Peabody, Massachusetts. And then the last one I was at uh, in the Berkshires. Oh, okay. Oh, that was that was my first one in the Berkshires. Yeah, okay. And then I've been going ever since. Like, I'm, Are you going to the one in Altoona this year? I'm not sure. If, if the Canadian dollar doesn't, value doesn't change, it's not worth it for me. I got you, yeah. I went to the NMRA convention in, in uh, Indianapolis and what was a hundred seventeen dollar room that the NR NMRA arranged for uh, members worked out to hundred and eighty nine dollars for me. That's, Ooh, that's a big jump. Bad exchange rate. Yeah. So yes, I'll, I'll be up I, there. Unless I do like Andy. Andy goes in, he, he was his Airbnb, and you get a bunch yeah. of guys and you share the price. Absolutely. That's something we should think about, Andy, because, you, you know, you're going, I'm going, Mike's going. Absolutely. That that makes oh, the most uh, sense for any of these, you know, tours. And meeting up with people is the most important thing, so, you know, or it is for a lot of us. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's no better modeling time you're going to get with everybody is – 
is all baiting, and setting around for data and such. Yep. This past weekend, I exactly. did clinics for the NMRA, and I managed to uh, connect with Imagine That Laser Art, Nick Masny, and I took oh, some, okay. I took some photographs of his display. Now, I don't think Andy, Andy oh, went wow. last night before I could I could show him. This is what he had out on display. Let me go full screen. That's impressive. Yeah, that big hotel structure is one of my next kits to build. Yeah. That's Doug Fuscali. <laughs> That's not here. That's Doug Fuscali, yeah. Like I did yeah. I did these pictures fairly quickly, so they they're not exactly clear. It's done with my cell phone. Not the greatest. But at oh, least that's and he does roof details, separate item that he sells. Yeah, they come with the kit, like what you've got, I've got. They come with some of the details that, that we can show some of as we get to, but they sell that as a separate item as well that you could buy just to put on your, you know, your DPM or whatever other structures. There you can see the interior dock detail. And that's like four faces of a backdrop that's that's sold as wood kit from him. So there's like four backdrop buildings in one box or what have you. I think it's okay. called Brewer's Alley or something like that. Yeah. Does he make that stuff at O scale? I if he doesn't, I'm sure he can. Yeah, he can. He does a lot of custom work too, but I don't think he's advertising uh, other skills on his website. The nice part of it is he does this all on MDF, medium density fiberboard. Yeah. Kind of like Jimmy Simmons does, Monster Models. And the brickwork, the brick detail is, is amazing. Well, the big benefit is what, you know, for, for, people listening is when you're painting a wood structure something we talked you know at some length about in the first couple shows or, or maybe the first show we did in this on this whole show was uh having to do so much cross bracing that you have to do on standard basswood construction but on this mdf you don't have to cross brace the material it's it's solid it's not a it is it's not a grain wood it doesn't have a grain structure to it so because it's it's chips it is a hungry oh. material when you put paint on it, though. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Well, here's a question I have. Maybe Miles might know. I don't know if you guys do. Has anybody ever tried doing one of these kits where they're going to paint it and pre-treated it with sanding sealer? Sealer. Uh, so, so it's supposed to help. I mean, I did pre-paint mine. I sprayed this this MDF structure. I don't normally do that because I normally want I'm normally building a wood structure, and I stain it. And, you know, do some some treatment to let the you know mineral spirits or 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 hairspray or something to let some of the material show through. But where I was doing brick, I pre-stained it with a light with a slightly brown. Uh, color just to kind of warm up the brick color that I was putting on top. Uh, okay. I've heard of it's actually a sanding sealer might might help prevent warpage. But you don't get warpage in this stuff. No sir. No. I ha I have heard of people using the sanding sealer, but the when I've heard them use it, it's more to make the stains or the paints that they're gonna apply later on take more evenly. And not okay. You don't. You don't have to use a sanding sealer. All you need is something like a, a, a Krylon spray, um, whatever. Just just to, to give it a basic seal of the of the wood, so it doesn't soak your paints right in. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Otherwise, it soaks paint up and leaves so many dry, you know, miscolored spots. And I wanted some inconsistency in my brick coloration. Heck, I used three or four different colors of red mixed together as I, with a with a, a sponge that I tore the end off of when I applied my paint to kind of give it some variability. Well, that's that's sort of what I'm doing now. 
Oh yeah, so you got a you, you're basing the color of black and the color. Black. I put some hunter line stains on. Uh, I put driftwood first, and then I went back with a light gray, and now I'm going to go at it with a, a, a red brick color. That. Yeah, basically same stuff I do, and I or same stuff I did the other day. That I really don't. I don't generally like the craft paints. I just don't have good luck with them. Or at least in my experience working on plastics and stuff, I don't. But on this MDF, and even on a lot of the wood, I don't get a great uh, result. But out of, on this particular product, on this MDF, the craft paints worked exceptionally well. All right, what well, I want to do a quick screen share and show you guys the structure that I'm basing mine off from, too. Of course, it's just a, I'm not scratch, you know, building it from scratch. Uh, and, and so it's not an exact uh, recreation of it or a prototype. It's, it's an approximation. All right, well, Google and me are not getting along so well. Let's try this one more time. All right, mine mine has been kicking me out. Did it last night a half dozen times as well. It does it too. So if my screen share is up and present, uh, this is a hard structure to get a good picture of too, by the way. Um, it's uh, this structure here that I'm modeling, which is a fairly large structure. I've got to build that depot as well. And it's a big brick structure. I'm sure it hasn't changed, didn't change a whole lot between this picture that took place, that was taken in 1920 and my year of 1950. It was still there in 1950, but not a long time after that. Uh, it outlasted the depot that was done, that was gone, you know, that burnt down in, in sometime in the early 60s. So. That's the structure. I've got a couple doors in there, you know, fairly straight wall over here. However, this structure presented me a couple challenges in that the kit from, uh, and I don't know if you'd call it really that challenging, but uh, some, some things that I had to, to add and resolve. So this structure from Imagine That Laser Art is uh, is meant to, to work either as a backdrop structure, that's a backdrop structure in general, but uh, you can build it a few different for formulations, all of which are a flat top roof structure. Whereas if you, from that structure, from that picture I just showed you, I have to build a pitched roof on it. So uh, I'm going to work through some of that construction as soon as I, I've got to get the walls done. Part of the reason that I just about always build structures as a superstructure and then finish that superstructure with paint so i get some of the advantages of the paint for sealing in gaps cracks etc uh, in this case i've got several things to do to each wall including setting the windows and doors and all these detail parts for for the wall so i'm going to build up wall each wall section and then assemble them and set a roof on top i've got to leave the roof uh separatable so so i can do the interior as well but just see how easy this material is to work with uh, this also has some of the same properties and similarities as the structure that that uh, Miles is working with as a fairly uh, common industrial uh, urban brick structure where it has uh, the pylons or pilasters. I think you call them a pilaster between the pilasters, pilasters, yep. Yeah. Pilaster, pilaster. Yeah, well, I, I'm from Kentucky, so uh, so any word that has an I in it, you know, I slip a, a few extra I's in there with it. You know, my business partner says that I spell the word white with about four I's. But, yeah, but you, uh, you did that with Depot, too. It's... But I, depot, Depot. Uh, <laughs> most, people here, most people here would say Depot. I, I try to learn from... from uh, you know, for people, if, if I don't know better, then I, I can't be expected to do differently. But if I learn something, you know, then I try to apply, you know, someone taught me that, you know, advertisement that, that I'd said all my life that the correct way to say that's advertisement. And I didn't believe it, but I looked it up online. So but the correct way to say it is advertisement. So I corrected myself. You know, if I know better, I won't continue to do something. 
So I'm going to glue this wood face together. It's amazing. I put um, an additional coat of paint on this. I put four or five different colors of red in two separate coats to get some variability in it. And they come back and touch some individual bricks. I don't think the camera's going to show this, but I'm going to try. Uh, see, the camera shows wood coming through, but you can't see that in person. I don't know how the camera shows that. Keep in mind, cameras do some pretty funny things. Um, cameras don't lie. Well, they, they show things the human eye can't see, however. Uh, they show some spectrums. Uh, for example, uh, like in the electronics and Arduino stuff, if you're setting up infrared, or, or even just in regular model railroad electronics, if you're setting up infrared sensors and you want to see if your infrared sensor is on, put your phone camera, uh, your, your phone camera at it. It can see that where the human eye cannot. Or put your phone camera at the back of an infrared remote and uh, you know, up for your TV and click the button a couple times, and you'll see that LED. Uh, produce visible light to your camera. So, uh, cameras show things the human eyes can't see. To it's me, amazing. it's entirely there's new, red. There's a new app out for your phone that grades your green screen. And what's not, so that you get it evenly lit. Yeah. And it's doing that exact same thing. Oh, yeah. Reduce. See, that's the problem I get with my... I've got a green screen set up a little bit, which, I mean, it's a, a really crappy... You know, it's a, a dozen pieces of poster board, uh, great poster board. Uh, but I get a lot of pixelization in the background. That's that's obviously because of that lighting condition. So that's this structure, but I've got to build the walls flat. And I don't know that I have to, but there's so many details that I want to commit to this. Uh, I'm also going to use that... that um, those interior details that Nick has created, imagine that laser arts created for uh, for those insets, which are essentially like shadow boxes. Uh, I was originally going to do that myself before. Uh, I was talking to Nick about those. Uh, what's recently, and he's like, uh, "Yeah, well, I've, I got a surprise for you." Then he already had them all produced exactly the same way as we were talking about. So, I mean, it started an original idea. Although I got this, the first idea about doing it that way um, from a, I think it was a woodland scenic structure, uh, a house kit that uh, Phil, uh, that Phil from our channel here had, had purchased. And it had these, it come with these little gray blocks, little boxes that had a light in each one of them. Came from the manufacturer that way. And I'm not positive it was a woodland scenic, but it seems like it was. And what a fascinating way to solve all the lighting problems you have if you just put walls in a structure. And I, I thought from then on, the way to do that is is with shadow boxes. And with this, I want to be able to light up. Now, in this case, you'd have a, a loading dock section that, that wouldn't have a lot of, a, doesn't need a lot of depth to it because you'd have boxes and shelving and stuff just inside the door anyway. Shadow boxes are perfect for that. But these top couple decks on mine are one big manufacturing floor. Um, and remember, that this structure dates from the late 1800s. And back then, the only way to solve this problem of, of, ha of having people be able to work inside of a building to do anything was just to put a doggone bunch of windows in there. Because lighting was not a trivial thing. And getting enough light that you could actually sew by was really difficult. So, so they put a lot of windows in them or skylights in them. So... In this case, it's got a lot of windows on here. It'll be one big manufacturing floor that's both two floors open, so it'll be an open area. I don't have to cross brace it, but I will once I get this done, flip it over and put a piece of square stock on the back of it to make a support for my flooring system that I'm going to build on top of that. Again, since it was probably a coal-heated structure, uh, 1950 in, in coal country, about everything was a coal-heated structure. There wasn't insulation or anything in the flooring between them, so I, I'm going to do enough of the flooring that you can see that. As you look through the dock doors, you'll be able to see that. See those floor joists. Uh, I've done that on several structures I've done where you actually see some of that interior. I built a garage recently, or some months ago, and put uh, stud walls in it. At some point, I want to build a, a structure from the ground up exactly the way the prototype would. I mean, stud wall it. You know everything from, from scratch. God, I remember doing that for school. 
<laughs> oh yeah, that was ages ago. Yeah, Andy, it's called Green Screener. Oh yeah, I have to get that. Yeah. Yeah. And it judges your green screen. Real quick before you go, I'll show one thing because I'm, I'm not sure how long I'll last. But this is two pieces that Centra I just tried as Andy was talking. I 45 it and glued it with just regular jet um, ACC. Yeah. And it is amazingly strong, and it's it's going to hold up, and I think it looks pretty good then on the brick corner. Oh can, yeah. Can you um, try? I did, I did have you got any um, uh, canopy glue or, or PVA glue? I don't. I just use like I say the crazy glue. Uh, okay. I have I have glued the center in the past with the PVA glue or, or with the PVC glue. The problem with the PVC glue, of course, is it's kind of gooey and it gets out on things. Yeah. But I had a lot more control over the crazy glue than I would. Um, but you could use pipe glue, glue right? Isn't that, a, isn't that a fairly liquid, low viscosity oh, kind of glue? Some of it is, yeah. Some of the cleaners are pretty vis viscous, but um, yeah. I don't know. I just, I, I think I'll probably use the crazy glue just because they have more control over it. Oh, yeah. And right. especially for setting windows and stuff, just because it's just a lot easier to work with. Yeah. Have you got going on, Barry? This system you've got, I've looked at that a few times. Tell us about that system with the magnets and stuff, too, before you get it built too much, because I'm fascinated by buying sure. one of those. This base here is uh, it's from Micromark. Uh, I bought it a few years back, uh, and it uses these steel plates, uh, separate steel plates and magnets, and uh, it's so convenient. It's nice and square. I always, you know, in case I bang it or anything, I always keep a square handy to check things big structures or anything you know that you need to really hold you can't clamp very easily this thing's fantastic a little tape to hold the tops put the magnets on the inside to hold the corner in that way and then put out here to, to brace this corner and like I said, up in here i put magnets there on over here but yeah you get some of the paint out of the or the glue out of the inside there yeah, but i'm not staining this structure so i'm not as concerned about getting glue on things as i am uh, with when i did my last build so yeah for any for anybody but north yeah, of the border um if you order it from micromark you have to specifically tell them to send it by land they will not send i ordered that thing three times and Really? Kept figuring out why wouldn't they send it? Why why do they keep see, saying it's back order? So I called them and they said, we cannot ship magnets airmail. Huh. What? Yep. Well, that's a good thing to know then, Ralph. That's what they told me. They ship hard drives airmail. Well, hey, I guess they don't know. Yeah, but they're not magnets like this. Drive. These things are... No, nice actually, and strong. Mag, the magnets that are in a hard drive are much stronger than those. Yeah, they did, did, but they're which to the advantage uh, of this true. argument, or the disadvantage of this argument, those the magnets in a hard drive are not exposed in a way that they can affect uh, surrounding. You know, a, a hard drive true, is not true. immediately magnetic. Yeah. That, no, do they make that thing big double sizes, or, or I mean, that's a good size building base. People got to remember that's an S scale structure. It's a it may yeah, not be the size of the one house it's working on, but it's a big structure. Yeah, this is the only size that I know they make it in. But I mean, literally, it's a flat plate with four flanges. You could have this built out of steel by any sheet metal manufacturing company. Go to any size you want, you know. I mean, the oh, length got it perfectly. Because you want it Yeah, well, if, you, if you're a machine shop, they should be able to do it perfectly square for you. Yeah, you'd hope so. Now, this thing seems to be pretty good on square, so. Yep. The nice part about that, and I don't know whether you've noticed it, the corners are open. On mine, they're wide enough. If I was doing a DPM kit and it was larger than that plate, I could actually have it stick out the corner. Yeah, it's just these two back corners here, that one and that this one over here, and then the one you know, yeah, these two. 
that way, like Ralph's right, you can go this wide here from the front all the way out the back this way. Let me align this camera in a little bit. Yeah, you can see them better, right? Yeah, the gap right here and then on this side as well. So that, that is, I, that's a feature I've never had to use yet. And like I said, if you're building a big curtain wall like Miles is in a smaller scale, you can just clamp it along here, you know, and then reverse it and clamp the other end of it, you know, build it in sections. So the I next have step I got. Are... Yeah. I have one of those and I really like it. The only problem is it doesn't fit hardly anything I build anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yours would be a little on the hard side. I mean, you could build like a, a normal size structure, but any kind of industrial structure, Miles, this and O scale would blow it probably. But Miles builds structures on a scale that a small human could live in them at full scale. So that's a different, you know. <laughs> or your cat. Uh, or you this is true. I think a Labrador could live in the wood that he's building right there. So yeah, I think so. Probably so. So I figured out that an F scale, uh, an eighth inch coffee star is about about twelve inches. I'm gonna go go to Hobby Lobby and buy a thousand pack, and I think they're long enough. And I'm going to use them to build the floor joist system in here. For the for the first floor, and then these windows up here, I, I imagine there's a third story up in the peak here. So um, I'll go ahead and build all the floors, but I'm going to leave the second floor and the top floor for later for like office space. Down the bottom is where I got to figure out where all my material goes. Uh, the next step for me to start is the uh, little structure that goes in the corner here built and attached to this so I gotta wait for this to dry because it sticks out around the front a teeny bit just a little maybe a quarter inch so it comes forward mm, half inch or so so I gotta let this dry I'll put some bracing in and then I'll build that piece and then get the paint coat on it get the interior paint coat and then uh, I can start building the floors and fitting them in. So the front, I I gotta you know build the front extension out here for the docks. I gotta figure out how big I'm going to make that because there's not a whole lot of information available on what this actually looked like. I mean, I I have there's some more books I have to go buy. I have one called Two Feet to Tidewater. That's the history of the railroad, and then there's a six book set called the Sheep Scott Valley and all about the structures on the line is volume one and there's some equipment, engines, facilities. So I'm going to buy volume one from the Wiscasset Museum and then that should give me enough information to look at the other buildings along the line and how this all looked and really get my uh, started properly so hopefully I'll be able to order that before July Johnny you got something for us before we move on yeah uh, got a question here <laughs> this is from MHB PODNK uh, his question is is there expiration time on model glue, he didn't specify which model glue. Uh, he said he had a ball of model cement and it would not hold together anything, so he bought a new bottle and it worked just fine. Yeah, I can't imagine, I can't think of any adhesive that I know of that doesn't have an expiration date on it. What it sounds like he's talking about is a, a solvent cement, like a, a testers or some kind of plastic cemented it it definitely has a, a shelf life uh not measured in decades you know it's measured in some number of months uh, with cas i get uh officially cas life expectancy is supposed to be around two years 
but you got to remember that you're not getting it directly off the assembly line. You know, that's been in storage for some time. So don't expect to get two years of life out of a bottle of, of super glue either. Put it in the freezer in a sealed bag and that'll help. For, C, for CA? Well, actually, probably for either one of them, for solvent or CA, that'd probably help. Well, I know it helps for the CA. I've had stuff that I've had for several years. If you put it in a zipper bag where it's tight and then put it in your freezer, it'll last for a long time. I would buy them, you know, 24 bottles at a time from Walters. Wow. And then put them in the freezer and just keep them. Yeah, that makes sense. It's slow down the, the process that's happening. I have the hardest time with contact cement. I'd give anything if I could buy, you know, half gallon of the stuff because I use a lot of it. But I never get more than about a quarter of the bottle. I never use more than about a quarter of the bottle before I throw it away. So I'm, I'm not at all reluctant to just waste contact cement, just holding something down temporarily for whatever because I, I throw most of the bottle away every time. Also, Phil Wyman uh, made a comment. Andy, it was a Walther's Cornerstone Aunt Lucy's house. Walther's part number 9333651. This kit came with the shadow boxed windows. It was a snap yep. together kit. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't a horrible kit. It wasn't a great kit, just somewhere down the middle of the road. But it had some really creative original ideas. I remember we talked about it at some length on one of the hangouts with. <laughs> you know, back back when it was just, uh, you know, like I said, when we've had shows talking to Jim uh, on here, I said there used to be so many of those hangouts where it was just us talking. And Phil built that structure, and it had such a fascinating idea of those little shadow boxes. What an incredible way to really simply and easily, and I'm, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do interiors on the next show, and I'm going to build some of those shadow boxes and, and show the Imagine that laser art shadow boxes at Nick's building, because that's just, just a great way to do. Unless you're trying to model a huge interior industrial area or something, uh, that's a better way than, you know, I've got a few houses with, you know, with walls and interiors and doors and all kinds of su such in it. Um, and that's a lot more trouble to get right than just building a few shadow boxes. Oh, you get, oh, okay, with the makeup sponge. I see what you got, Ralph. I was about to ask you about it, but. I think we lost. Yeah, I think we lost a Ralph, but uh, I was looking for, I was planning on using a makeup sponge when I did my stone, my, my work as well for my brick. I just could not find, I couldn't find them. I, I guess my wife stole them back from me, but. I ended up using a piece of the foam material like Ralph likes to use for locomotive and rolling stock weathering, which is uh, eh, like that stuff. It's a closed, uh, closed, it's a closed cell foam, I think, but it's weird. It's just packing foam. It's got a it's kind of weird texture to it. But it's really nice for putting texture. I've done used it on rock work. I've used it on some rolling stock. Uh, start using a rolling stock at, with Ralph's recommendation because it does leave a interesting and creative texture. Hey, Ralph. I'm back. I'm sorry I had to leave for a second. Okay. No worries. So you're going to use a makeup sponge to apply the your red colors here? Yep. And, then, and I'm only going to put a very light coat on and I'm going to try and experiment. I bought... I bought some um, printer's ink or artist ink that I'm going to try and use. And I'm going to airbrush it on. Oh. And I did a similar effect with, you know, be, you know, you need those random quite dark bricks that they mixed in. I don't know why they did that, but like my house has them as well, but they do that. Um, it's like an HB pencil. It's a piece of graphite that's got paint on the outside, so it looks like a pencil. This this is what I use for doing my weathering on my trucks and so on.
artist supply store or an HP pencil works just as good. You remember the yellow pencil you had when you were a kid at school with the eraser on the end? Like that? Except mine has a needle in the end. <laughs> that, that needle, by the way, is, I don't know whether you can see it, it's it's the it's the head of a sewing needle with the end of it cut off. So now it's like two fingers. And I use that for applying crazy glue. The capillary action takes the glue up into the two fingers. And then you take it to wherever you want. And you can lay it right down in the spot. I built a few jigs with... Uh with needles like that. I used it recently for planting a bunch of uh, grass growth through my water. Yep. Just took the grass through it. I use it for that too. I think it was you. I'm pretty sure you're, I see the idea when you were talking about using it with glue. And I got, I think I took the idea and run with it to, to stick a, that's when I was doing my Volkswagen bus, my junkyard bus. Yes, yes, absolutely. I got the idea to do, you were doing that super glue with it. I was like, well, I'd work just, that worked just dandy for doing, just to get the grass through, you know, through little holes into the, you know, into the water surface. Um, that is not for the faint of heart, because the dog got it, it's tedious, it takes a lot of time, but uh, it got some really good results. So. I'm happy with the results. So you're using a, a, a pigment, an, an, an ink, right? You're going to spray an ink on it? I'm, I'm going to use a, a light coating of this first. And then I'm going to overspray it with the ink. That way those the graphite for those bricks will show through. Because I, I did mine first and then come back with a toothpick or a skewer or something and painted the individual bricks at where I wanted some parity. But I could have colored them ahead of time if I'd used a thin enough co coating of paint. Probably so no, suppose that it works. It, it seems like some wood wood material shows through at least on camera shows through the paint so This would be easy to do in mild scale in, in HO. I mean, these bricks are small. <laughs> yeah, they're tough. I mean, I painted them with a toothpick, a, a, you know, a fully sharpened toothpick to try to get them to, and it's still tough. That's right. <laughs> or you can go halfway and go to S scale. The thing I like about S and O scales is the sensible uh, the sensible proportion that happens, you know, in quarter inch scale or in S scale where it's three sixteenths to a foot or, you know, in O scale it's quarter inch to a foot. It's easy math to do in your head, whether you're a P whether you use the, the excuse of being a PE teacher or not, nobody wants to do a lot of math in their modeling, I don't think. And, <laughs> and it's just really easy in, a, in those scales. Whereas in 187th, in HO scale, the, Math is fairly complicated. And G scale is yeah, kind of. You just gotta, gotta think a little bit there. You gotta use a calculator a little bit there. I'm pretty good with math, and you still the the breakdown on it is just not. It, it's not sensical. Well, if you do on G scale, it then you're in one to twenty nine, one to twenty second, one to twenty four. One to thirty two. God, it goes crazy. And then they have, depending upon who's the matter, whether it's you know, full scale or narrow scale, I mean, nuts. Yeah, it's crazy how these things got so complicated. I mean, you know, scale has its difficulties with, with scale and gauge. If you're, you know, like the, you know, the standard gauge, O scale two rail stuff being five foot between the rails is a problem for a lot of people. That's what the, the you know, been such a major crop up with the Proto 48 movement. But 
I mean, they all have their difficulties, and it all stems from from trying to match the track gauges to a European standard. Because uh, O scale in Europe is one to forty three, right? I think it is. Yeah, something like that, and then it's one. It's even different for HO. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah their double O is uh, one to seventy six. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. But we lucked out at our track gauge match. Yeah, but and, they, and scale in Japan is one one fiftieth. Yeah, every one of those scales, the actual proportions have to be off a little bit, and it, and it seems like. But also, I've heard them, you know, some of the British modelers that are exceptional, even say this. They're less concerned about exact scale proportions, and, and for good reason. There's reasons to not be as concerned about that. Then, then they're concerned for the overall look and feel that they're trying to capture. Uh, and then, you know, with our scales, we, we try to enforce depth and we do things like like force perspective, which are actually could be quite a bit easier if you would use some OO or double O stuff, which is one to 76, I think. You could get some of that stuff and use it in the foreground, you know, British prototype, use it in the foreground, and it'd be slightly larger. And we just don't, the only problem we have with force, force perspective, in my opinion, is we don't have a good scale just below HO scale. Whereas if you're an O scale, you could use S scale stuff. Or if you were in yeah. you know, S scale, you could use HO. But in HO scale, the next scale we have down to us that's standard is, is TT scale. And when's the last no, time? No, no, no. You can do N scale. Pardon me? I've seen people use N scale and force perspective in HO. I have two. It's just it's got to be pretty far off in the distance, you know. If you're looking yeah, at the yeah, mountain well, side, that's true. Way, it's got to be pretty far back because it's it's half it the size, but it's a quarter of the actual proportion. It doesn't yeah. have to be far back. Um, Dick Elwell, I showed you the video at one point. Um, the Music Valley. He does a thing on force perspective, and he's done it all. He's gone from H O to I think Z scale, all in a space of nine inches. Yeah, and Earl wow. Smallshaw has done a bunch of that stuff like that too. Oh, that's who it was. Yeah, Smallshaw. Oh, yeah. yeah, he built like little bitty buildings that I think maybe were even, maybe were even smaller than in scale. I mean, he just took a block of wood and painted a door on it. I mean, that sounds like it was horrible, but he's an exceptional modeler, so his you know his results were just unparalleled. Uh, and it, it was that, and it's like, like you said, a few inches deep. I'm gonna head for bed, guys. This is good night. <laughs> All right, Miles. Scott Miles. Sorry to be the party pooper, but I really have been sick the last few days, so I'm gonna try and give my body a little bit of rest. Yes, sir. You gotta get, gotta get better. The work uh -huh. you guys are doing is looking great. We look forward to the next show. Maybe I'll have the building a little more completed. Show a little more about what I'm doing. Okay. Take care. All righty. I got to get Corbels. I'm, like he was talking about the Corbels. These are, and I painted mine up as separate entities, but I, I taped them up. I'll show you this little kind of crappy jig that I made up. Scraps of foam core, but I, all these materials. And then I uh, here I, I put layers of tape and stuck the material up in there. I didn't want to paint. The surface that I'm gluing together. I didn't want that thickness to separate the material. So I, I taped the areas where you adhere one piece on top of another. But that, uh, imagine that laser art has, has these various configurations that you can, that you get from him for the, uh, well, don't go there. Um, for these these detail at the top or the, the corbels or the top molding and you can get and he's got several pieces and you can build it in several different configurations like everything else about his kits they they offer you know it's kind of a scratch builder's dream or a kit basher rather might be the, is the better term kit basher dream but you can build them in the you know build this stack of these pieces together in three different parts or you could use two or three parts but i'm building it up this way it's 
I can't tell, as you can tell for that picture I showed you the building I'm working with, I have to, I have to guess at this, an educated guess, because I, I just don't have the detail. I don't have a picture close enough. So I got to build up enough of this material to go across and then let the glue set up, and then I've got to cut angles on this material at the edge of the wall. I've got to figure out how to, how that corbel, when it returns around the wall, with a pitched roof, with a, uh, a gable roof, like a you know a standard house has a gable roof on it. This structure also will have a gabled roof on it. And when that corbel returns around the wall, it comes into that gable. There's a couple ways that normally gets dealt with. On a house, a lot of times you just have it come around and there's a, a flat end point. Um, there's there's some some you know nicer homes, uh, more more expensive homes, etc. Et well will return around the corner with the, the soffit, which is the section underneath the uh, the overhang of your of your structure on a gable roof, you have the soffit underneath. And as it returns around, they will continue that out a bit down that wall with the continuation of that soffit. And there'll be a little bitty pitched roof right there that may have just two or three shingles on it. That's called a birdhouse, uh, or often referred to as a birdhouse as it returns around. Of course, you wouldn't do that in this case, but you do need to return that soffit in some way. And this detail, brick detail, will have to continue around the corner in some way as well. So I have to cut an angle on it and then figure out how I'm gonna match that to the fact that I'm putting a pitched roof on it. Andy, I don't remember whether you mentioned it or not the other day when you were doing your, uh, your sponge work. But uh, in order to get so that you don't, when you put your sponge down with the paint, so that you don't get the sharp edges of, of the corners, just pull off some of the uh, foam. Oh yeah, yeah, I did that for it. I, I couldn't find my makeup sponges. I, and I, I still have not found them, and my wife has still not fessed up to have installed them. Um, but I took, uh, I took the sponges of a couple different types and tore the edges off those. Uh, this was a piece of that white foam, that white kind of weird close cell, kind of slick, uh, kind of slick or slobby filling foam, uh, like you do uh, rolling stock weathering with. And I tore a rough edge into that. And I also bought these little plunger kind of contraptions. I haven't thought this one away yet, but you can get these in all kinds of different sizes and stuff. Buy a big old bag of them for like two dollars or something. I think at Walmart. And I, I took a, a pair of tweezers and, and tore, you know, tore it all to crap at the bottom. So um, that made a pretty good surface for painting. But a makeup sponge is pretty hard to beat. Yep. Yep. I had a whole bag of them, too, and I, I'm convinced my wife stole them, but she's not admitting to it. Well, you can have. Pardon me? I said you can have easy. Yeah, well, I wouldn't mind another trip back to Canada again. Oh, hey, get them at the dollar store. You don't even have to go to the beauty there you shop go. anymore. Oh, yeah, okay. A dollar store is rich in modeling supplies. You know, these nail files. Yeah. I, every time I sit the wife them. goes. Those things are useful as the devil. You better believe it. Every time the wife goes, I tell her, you know, she I, laughs at me. I do it on purpose now. I tell her, get me a bunch of sanding sticks. Yeah, I like to use these, the, the sanding blocks, too. These foam sanding blocks, you can get like a depot. Uh, I get them in various grades. They work out pretty good. So, oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. My, my little side shed is all glued together now. So uh, I got to let this all sit up and dry. And then uh, I can look at doing some bracing on the side shed. And then I'll get pick a collar for the paint coat and get some paint on this thing. What kind of adhesive were you using on that a minute ago? I meant to ask you because it looked tight, awful. Tight bond to wood glue. Oh, okay. That's that's more uh good stuff. It's yeah, yeah. it's a lower viscosity than this material or this gorilla glue, which is quite a bit thicker, which a lot of yeah. times I like, but I can't apply it with a paintbrush. No, no. This stuff is it actually works for the I use that or uh, Elmer's carpenter glue as well. So, 
you know, since I'm at a natural stop here right now, um, I'm going to do do a miles and say good night to everybody. Go get some sleep for work tomorrow. So, uh, gentlemen, I will see you after the month. Of, well, I'll be on the live show this weekend. But after that, I won't see anybody until uh, July. Since uh, June 24th, I'm getting married. So I'm going to take the month of June off and oh. do, do wedding stuff. Have a little family vacation stuff before the weddings. You know you're not getting paid for your time off, right? What's that? You know you're not getting paid for that time off, right? Not from you guys. <laughs> I know. You guys are too cheap to pay me for time off. That's right. No paid uh, vacation. No paid week. vacation here. Heck, no paycheck, period. No health insurance, nothing. A health insurance, you're starting to get really picky now. <laughs> this is true. All well, right, gentlemen, it's a pleasure. So uh, I will see you guys uh, on Saturday night. And after that, uh, I'll be talking to you or whatever. But uh, I'll see you all in July, okay? Yep. All right, everybody, take care. I will be shortly at a point where all my glue is wet as well. That's kind of one of the dis. Like I said once before, talking about wood construction, it, it's a it's a waiting game, and that's why it seems like uh, you know typical plastics modelers. And we're going to do some plastic structures as well, and I got nothing against those either. But it's just a different process, and it you know typically you'll start a, a styrene structure and build it beginning to end. It's just typical as part of the process, minus a little downtime for painting. With wood, most of the wood modelers and, and I uh, have a whole lot of kids working all at one time because of because you just have a lot of downtime waiting. You know, once you get everything aligned and glued and some, you know, some really expensive, you know, specialized wood clamps on it like I've got, uh, you know, there's not a lot of, that's why you start working on other details. I was starting to run out of some of the parts, though. I built this kit come with... Uh, with pallets, they're fairly good looking pallets. Uh, I flipped them over and put some extra bracing on the bottom because that's what I'm used to seeing. It comes with a whole stack of these things. And uh, those are this rooftop water tower. I haven't put the skid on it yet. Um, and a concrete base with pretty good direct, you know, instruction stuff. But I, I took it and chipped the edges of it like you would with concrete and I dusted it with some talcum powder like I often do. You know, I've got the doors and I've got my my glass from Sierra Bottle Works on it. So they're real glass. If I can get some reflection on this so you could really t tell. You know, they're real glass windows. They just, you know, they look particularly good. And I started putting those on, on these windows as well. And it's just, that real glass has a, has a pretty incredible, pretty, you know, remarkable or unmistakable effect. And especially since I'm going to do you know, an interior of the structure, you can see through it quite easy. Of course, then you got to be willing to do windows because I'll have to clean them all. Like Ralph was saying, it comes with so, quite a bit of detail, rooftop details from uh, from smokestacks. Uh, I also took and chipped the edges of this. Uh, took an exacto and dug at it some to get some, you know, some roughness on the edges. I just can't run over show that. Um, and then I took a, a Took a wire brush to the edges of it, tore the edges up pretty good, which looked like you know concrete that's been around a while. And it comes with a roof uh, exit door, which I I've built up, and uh, you know, and painted some weathering effect on it, and painted it. Got the door; it's got you know real glass in that door as well. Uh, I made the trim for it. It had some trim laser cut into the door, but I added some additional pieces to that. Uh, I got that painted there, but I haven't put the raw roofing material on it so far. I just painted the surface, but I'll have to, uh, I'll have to put some tissue paper on that. Do a raw roofing with it. Come with a dock, which this is quite amazing. That's not by weathering. That's just laser cut into the dock surface, so pretty pleased with that so I'll glue these couple pieces up ahead of the next show uh, next show we've got uh, coming up is uh, 
Uh, Johnny gave us a date here a few minutes, but we're, we're going to get into some, some fairly serious work on doing interiors because we'll have a, you know, solid substructure of, of assemblies done. Sorry, let's look at what Ralph was working with over there. I'll have it uh, back in a second. We'll take a look at that before we close this show out for sure. Oh, that's got a lot of variability in it. Yeah, that looks like it's been around for a long time. That paint looks almost orange until you put it on the brick. Well, that's why I chose to use the hunter line on, on the brick first to give it some body to the color. Sure. Because the color that I'm using, I watered it down, made it a wash. So I'm getting the hunter line color, I'm getting the MDF color, and I'm getting the paint color all at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah, that toad or intonation that you're getting from it, it's, I painted my, my brick with a with a brown color as opposed to a flat gray primer, which I've done for several others. I mean, this is just a, a plastic wall, but I painted it with a, with a gray. And it's just that the intonation is just quite a bit different than what you get when you paint it with the brown. The brown just is a much warmer brick surface. So I, I can't wait to see what this is going to look like with the ink on top. And if that, if that doesn't work, then I start all over again and I paint it solid. Yeah, yeah. You're not out anything. I mean, you're not hurting the material any by, you know, the coats of, of, of ink and, and, you know, thin washes are so, so thin they don't dilute your, uh, don't dilute your detail any. That's a positive effect. It's amazing how much that color changes as you. Put it on top of that. Boy, those hundred line stains are just some kind of something anyway. I, I'm pleased with them. Plus, it's wet, so when it dries, it's going to look a different color again. Well, since most of us have drying materials, drying paints, I think we'll call, you know, maybe call this one just maybe a couple minutes short of two hours, hour and a half or so shows a, quite a bit of material to cover anyway especially when you're dealing with wood structures and inevitably get to a stopping point. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate everybody joining us. Um, uh, next month, again, we'll be doing interiors. Uh, you know, we'll, we look at those uh, parts from uh, Badge of That Laser Art with those little shadow boxes. I'm going to build some shadow boxes, some flooring systems on top of mine for the top deck. Uh, and kind of get deep, deep into uh, – into interiors and some interior lighting and interior details. So that's really the fun of this stuff anyway. I mean, on the first show, we we spent a bit of effort on the first structure that we built, you know, with how to glue a box together, you know, how to support that cross bracelet, et cetera. We're gonna have to cover a lot of that material for these future shows and we can start getting into the really fun stuff. And that's really bringing them to life. The interior and putting people in them and desks and uh, it makes it look like your little world, your 187th or 164th or 148th or 1160th scale world is coming to life to some degree. So so we'll see you guys next month for the June show. Thank you very much for joining us for this show. And if you want to take us out, Johnny. Okay. <laughs> You can uh, show that screen if you want on the way out, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Andy's, uh, big Andy Sweeney's. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, I might put it up as a uh, thumbnail. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I want to tell everybody to go to YouTubeMileBuilders.com. There you can check the schedules for the Tuesday, Wednesday, and the Saturday shows. Uh, Thursday shows are uh, every Thursday of each week and uh, be sure to click on the emag and sign up to get an email notification when the emag comes out that is a free publication and also go to the YouTube to YouTube Mall Builders and check out uh, JD's uh, short video they did for the e-magazine that was a nice video he did there 
uh, give you a little update on the schedule for the rest of this month. Uh, next week on the 17th, we've got the uh, Arduino workshop. <coughs> the live show will be uh, May the 20th. And then May 23rd will be Build a Track Planner. And don't forget that the Tuesday and Wednesday shows are at 8 o'clock Central, 9 o'clock Eastern. The Thursday and the Saturday live show are at 9 o'clock Central, 10 o'clock Eastern time. So next week will be the Arduino show. And then that Saturday will be the uh, live show with Barry and Big Bill. So with that said, I want to say uh, have a good night. I want to thank Andy, uh, Miles, Barry, Ralph for another good show tonight. And hope everybody enjoyed it. And we will uh, see everyone at the Arduino Workshop next week on Wednesday night. So y'all have a good week and a good weekend. Night, John. Goodbye. Andy, have a good night. You too, brother.